add to the strength of your victory, uh, the strength of your love poured out on the cross and victorious in the resurrection. Uh, guide this, this class, open our minds and hearts to that strong love of yours that we grow in through the virtues and that uh, tender love of yours which we see in your wounded heart. We ask all this in the holy and saving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we're going to speak about virtue and virtue in the life of contemplation and contemplation in the life of virtue. So what I want to say is that uh, virtue is both the, the strong walls of the interior garden. It's the strong walls that allow us to enter into the peace and stillness of contemplation and protect us there in contemplation and union with the Lord. And so virtue has both the strong walls but also the, the fragrant flowers of the interior garden. So they're also a, a fruit of contemplation. They help guard contemplation but they're also as we come to a fullness of virtue only through contemplation and receiving the graces of the Lord in this way. And these uh, virtues are fragrant flowers before the Lord, delight in his heart and our interior garden. So we'll find that a lot through John of the Cross and St. Bernard. So we're actually going to spend more of the the second half of the the class today on uh, virtue. And uh, this, I wanted to say more about uh, the wounds of love um, for the first half and then towards the end of the first half we'll transition more to, to the virtues so we can think about St. Bernard says um, for our love to be perfect it needs three qualities do you remember what those are? tender tender wise what's the other one? wise wise yeah strong yeah exactly wow I don't know why kind of strong <laughs> great there you go what sermon did that come from? <laughs> so that would be like A plus plus plus. That would be A plus plus plus. Sermon 20. So yeah, for our, our love to be perfect, to grow to perfection, it's going to have to be all three. Tender, wise, and strong. You know, we often begin with a tender love for the Lord, but it's going to have to become that, that mighty oak tree. Our love begins as that tender shoot sprouting up from the earth. It's going to have to become that mighty oak tree. Right? But even the mighty oak tree uh, puts forth new new limbs, new sprouts, new tenderness. Um, and so we're going to need all of that. And how are we going to grow in this uh, the strength of love? Especially the life of virtue, right? We can think of the, the virtue as... Uh, growing in that strength of love. So we begin with this tender love. Um, and a, a why has to be a wise love. Wisely ordered. Our whole life taken up in the one thing necessary, the pursuit of the Lord. And a wisely ordered life from a wisely ordered love. And then uh, to grow strong enough, it's gone to, you know, the virtue. I mean, the life of vir- the virtues are involved in all of this. So we can think especially about the strength of virtue. And so that's going to take some time. It takes the you know the years and decades of religious life are part of this. One of the things is you know as we're working on the strong love, sometimes our love can lo- lose that tenderness. So it's interesting that Saint Bernard says it's all those three that are in the perfect love, not just a, kind of a strong. Um, uh, like rigorous kind of love or zealous or zealot, zealot. Um, I'm not trying to find the fight word anyways people can as they kind of go through difficulties they can lose the tenderness but we don't want to lose the tenderness of love as we all three so we can think about the wounds of love in terms of the tender love that's going to have to be part of it and to think that the Lord's own heart is wounded with love for us. As to kind of get back into that theme of the wounds of love, do you remember 
the three types of wounds of love and what they're caused by? Yeah. The first one is caused by seeing God in creation and natural Exactly. Things. You don't have to remember the name, okay, but if you get yeah, that's not. The fair. second one is by spiritual, like reading scripture, hearing yeah. things, not the sore wound. So, yeah, something. And then the third one is caused by, like, a direct contact with the Lord, and that's, like, dying. Yep, exactly. Awesome. Very good. Yep, so the three types of wounds that John the Cross lays out and their source created things, the beautiful sunset, creating that longing in the Lord, longing in our heart for the Lord. And so it's a knowledge of the Lord that stirs up our desire and we yearn for more. Second level, yeah, the articles of faith, the things of faith, scripture, um, the mysteries of the rosary. And then the third level uh, is, yeah, the touches of God. His visitating the soul, his visits of the soul, and uh, touching us with uh, that I don't know what behind the mystery, the no say K. So, what uh, stanza is that from? It's fair to Canticle. Seven. Yeah! <laughs> 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 you wrote it down, so that's good. <laughs> So those are, um, yeah, the wounds of love uh, caused from a knowledge of the love, of knowledge of the Lord, and that stirring up our desire. There's another dimension of the wounds of love that Father Haggerty. So this is his new book, John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, and he has a chapter on uh, wounds of love, uh, branding marks of contemplation. Um, and he, he draws out before our eyes very much kind of the painful, yearning, longing, em- emptiness of not having yet the possession of the beloved, the Lord, which you only have in heaven completely. And so that kind of yearning and emptiness and kind of still pressing on. So he brings out, yeah, more of like the crucifying side of the wounds of love. And, um, and so, but yeah, we'll look at some of that a little bit later. So that's another, you know, that's where um, these wounds kind of bring us a lot of times. But just to look briefly at John's classification of these three kinds of wounds. It's interesting that he does note that that encounter with the unose ke, the I don't know what, beyond our, our stammering, that that happens even like within the reading of scriptures. Um, so he says, the soul says in the stanza that these rational creatures cause two kinds of suffering of love in her. The rash are so the ones who proclaim the gospel is what he means there by rational creatures. So those both, okay, so um, maybe angels too. He mean, okay, whatever, he, uh, it's not so far causes two kinds of suffering of love in her, the sore wound and death. The sore wound, because as she asserts, they relate a thousand graces of the beloved and their teaching about the, both the mysteries of faith and the wisdom of God. And death, uh, dying love, from what, as she says, lies behind their stammering, the filling and knowledge of the divinity sometimes unveiled in what she hears about God. So just to note there that the t- number two and three are kind of intermingled sometimes. Reading the scriptures, you do come in contact with that. No seke. So the third of you know the touches of the Lord, it's not just in the silence of yourself, far removed from all images or something. It also happens within the context of reading the scripture. Because you are coming in contact with that, I don't know what, beyond our standing. He develops upon this in um, a sense of Mount Carmel, book two, chapter 26, paragraph seven through 10. So much so much was John of the Cross to get him right. Like you have to see other passages uh, in relationship to the passage you're looking at and you have to kind of bring things together. And because, you know, he, he does treat the same thing in different places, so it's good to bring it all together, which can be difficult, which is why it takes like 10 years of reading through his corpus to kind of begin to bring things together. 
And if you don't, then it kind of becomes one-sided. You don't see it in its context. Um, or you don't, another side of it, you don't appreciate the fullness of what his teaching on a certain on a certain thing. So Ascent to Mount Carmel, book 2, chapter 26, number 7 through 10, uh, opens up before us, yeah, this, like encounter with the Lord in the scriptures, that opens us to that uno se que, that I don't know what. So let me just read a little bit of that. As Father Haggerty says in his book, you know, the first time through John of the Cross, the second time through, you really haven't gotten what he's about. Because it's, it's, it's hard to kind of take it all in. Uh, it takes re- it takes him taking him up as a companion, you know, over like the decades, where his uh, depth and, and riches really come out. So, uh, number seven of chapter twenty-six, book two of Santa Carmel. These touches, you know, which we also he just spoke about, and um, we heard him speak in spiritual canticle seven. He also talks about the touches that cause these wounds. These touches engender such sweetness and intimate delights in the soul. Through these touches, individuals become so courageous and so resolved to suffer many things for Christ that they find it a special suffering to observe that they do not suffer for Christ. God usually grants these divine touches which cause remembrances of him at times when the soul is least expecting or thinking of them. Um, or again, sometimes these touches occur on the uttering or hearing of a word from sacred scripture or from some other source, you know, some other spiritual reading. These touches do not always have the same efficacy. And so there can be different levels of it. And it can be very simple early on, very um, gentle. Um, and then, you know, later it can be a life-changing thing. You know, my sister, my bride, and that shakes your core. And you're changed, and a year later you're still stumbling over it. You're, you're staggering because of it. Uh, these touches do not always have the same efficacy, nor are they always felt so forcefully, because they are often very weak. Yet, no matter how weak they may be, one of these divine awakenings and touches is worth more to the soul than numberless than numberless other thoughts and ideas about God's creatures and our works and works. You know, so our own meditating on things are great and we need it and we do make progress with that. But these touches bring us further than we can go ourselves. Then he says, number 10, this is very important. I do not say that people should behave negatively regarding this knowledge as they should with the other apprehensions. Because this knowledge is an aspect of the union toward which we are directing the soul. And which is the reason for our doctrine about denudation or denying and detachment from all other apprehensions. So, you know, in the Senate Mount Carmel, uh, John is very strong in uh, moving on beyond certain apprehensions in spiritual life, words we receive, visions, uh, senses of the Lord. Um, but there are some that are the very union that we're going for, are part of the union. And uh, things like this, um, we do not have to be you know, so severe in re- re- renouncing because they are that deeper contact with the Lord. The I don't know what. He says that, um, I wish I had the other references here. Well, I have my cheat sheet. Because <laughs> it is an important, it's a, a way that people just often misunderstand John of the Cross. Um, you know, first of all, the set of Mount Carmel, his stated purpose is he's going to lead us in the way of show us how to attain the poverty of spirit, the nakedness of spirit, the detachment uh, needed for union with the Lord. And so his purpose is sort of a negative one, how to kind of um, chop these things aside away. And so it has that negative emphasis, but that's not the whole of his doctrine, but that's the purpose of that treatise. But then to note, even within that, um, there are sort of encounters with the Lord that can be remembered and do help propel us to the Lord, awaken our, our love of the Lord, 
awaken our, our knowing and loving of the Lord. And just as long as we allow those things we remember to kind of push us up into the mystery of God. And we're left with just faith, hope, and charity in the incomprehensible mystery of God. Uh, um, okay, here, you know, here we are. Good. So just if you want to write down these references. So Ascent, uh, Book 3, Chapter 24, Number 4. Ascent, Book 3, uh, 14, 2. 13, 6. And then Ascent, Book 3, uh, 35, 2. 35, 6. And we, we spoke about this before, but I'll just say it again. Uh, you know, the, our attitude towards created things, towards images, towards certain remembrances of God in prayer, they're good insofar as we're moved and strengthened by the delight that they bring in our ascent to God. Um, they are helpful as they awaken the knowledge and love of God as they move the spirit to love, as they move the will to devotion, these are John's phrases, so that we can soar to God alone. I'll just go, uh, to, I might as well just treat this now. I don't know if I've done this before. Is this sounding familiar? All right, Martin, okay. So, Ascent, book Three, fourteen, two. Yeah, so he's saying a lot of so the purification of hope, the purification of memory through hope, involves moving beyond our past experiences of the Lord. Right, God is beauty ever ancient, ever new. So we want to encounter the mystery of God in the present moment, and not depend on past experiences of the Lord, or don't try to recapture past experiences of the Lord but to encounter God in the present moment in his newness, beauty ever ancient, ever new. So he's really strong on, you know, denying, renounce, re renouncing this thought of God, this kind of um, past experience of the Lord, this image of the Lord. But then he goes on to say, well, wait a second, there are some apprehensions of the Lord that we, we shouldn't renounce and that are helpful and lifting us to the Lord. So uh, 14.2, spiritual knowledge in the memory. Right. So he's saying, you know, I mentioned the purpose of the treatise, which he says in the beginning. Because this is another thing that's misunderstood. People will take a sediment caramel and take it as kind of the whole of John's doctrine. And then John does appear very negative. Yeah, so he, in the very, very first words of the Senate on Carmel, this treatise explains how to reach divine union quickly. It presents instruction and doctrine valuable for beginners and proficients alike, that they may learn how to unburden themselves of all earthly things, avoid spiritual obstacles, and live in that complete nakedness and freedom of spirits necessary for divine union. All right, so that, that's his purpose. And then he reminds us that that's his purpose like 10 or 12 times throughout the, the treatise. And so it's a very kind of narrow focus of the ascent of Mount Carmel. It's not the whole of his doctrine. It's one aspect, an important aspect. Um, but it's, it's, just, it's focused on that and so a lot of times people take that as kind of the all of John the Cross and they don't read it in light of spiritual canticle and the visits of the Lord and these things and so they, they miss it. Um, so I, yeah, anyways, I could give you references to, but yeah, 10 or 12 times throughout the treatise he said, you know, remember this is the point of the treatise, you know, how to, we, we would talk about this here now, the consolations that come and help you to advance uh, but, you know, that's not the purpose of the treatise. So, uh, book one, uh, the end of chapter 14, uh, he says, you know, here would be the time to talk about how, you know, touches of the Lord uh, make it all sweet and the burden light uh, through the dark night. 
Uh, but he says it's better to experience that than to talk about it. And then he just moves on then with the purpose of his treatise, which is you know how to live in that complete nakedness and freedom of spirit necessary for divine union, being unburdened uh, by these things that are less than God, yet things that propel us to God. And two twenty eight one. Uh, I just have that written down, so let me see what that says. Yeah, okay, yeah, so 28.1, he says that, you know, so this is book 2, 28.1, so like halfway through the treatise. The discreet reader must always keep in mind my intention and goal in this book. To guide the soul in purity of faith through all its natural and supernatural apprehensions and freedom from deception and every obstacle to divine union with God. Um, and so again, like there are like 10 or 12 times throughout a Senema Carmel and Dark Night of the Soul, which is just a continuation of, of the ascent, where he kind of hints at that. Uh, the discreet reader must always keep in mind my intention and goal in this book to guide the soul in purity of faith through all its natural and supernatural apprehensions. Um, so that's his goal, and that's why it's so hard. It's, he's kind of so hard-lined on that. But even with that goal... He does mention here in chapter 14, number two, well, actually there are some apprehensions that it, it is okay to kind of call to mind and allow you to, to allow to awaken your mind and heart to the Lord and propel you to the Lord. So he says, concerning what has to do with our intention here, which is to explain, which is to explain uh, the way the memory should conduct itself in order to advance to union, I merely state as I have just explained in the preceding chapter about formal images, to which class this knowledge of creatures belongs, that this knowledge may be remembered when it produces a good effect. Not in order to retain it, you know, kind of possessively, you know, seek that experience again, uh, you know, hold on to the consolation or something. Possessively, um, this, this knowledge may be remembered, this knowledge of God may be remembered when it produces a good effect, not in order to retain it, but to awaken the knowledge and love of God. But if the remembrance of this knowledge and of creatures produces no good effect, the soul should never desire the memory of it. But as for the knowledge of the Creator, I declare that a person should strive to remember it as often as possible because it will produce in the soul a notable effect. For as we affirmed here, the communications of this knowledge are touches and spiritual feelings of union with God, the goal to which we are guiding the soul. The memory does not recall these through any form, image, or figure that may have been impressed on the soul, for those touches and feelings of union with the Creator do not have any. It remembers them through the effect of light, love, delight, spiritual renewal, and so on, produced in it. Something of this effect is renewed as often as the soul recalls them. Now he uses the word touches and spiritual feelings of union with God. So this word feeling is kind of ambiguous in John the Cross, and there are kind of two levels. There's kind of the emotional feeling of God, which he calls us to renounce. But then uh, later, and he's speaking of spiritual marriage, um, there is, in the deep caverns of the soul, there's a spiritual feeling that comes into contact with the Lord. And so it's on a deeper level. I mean, where it's just, there are only so many words to use. <laughs> um, and so he has to use this one. So it can be a little confusing sometimes. Are these spiritual feelings good or bad? Well, it depends on what level um, and the subtlety of them, the purity of spirit of them. Um, so yeah, so calling to mind these encounters with the Lord from the past can sometimes renew the, the same effects, renew the, the same graces. Um, Thirteen six, he touches on the same thing. In these apprehensions coming from above, individuals should only avert to the love of God that is interiorly caused. They should pay no attention to the letter and rind, 
what is signified, represented, or, or made known. Thus they should pay heed not to the feelings of delight or sweetness, not to the images, but to the feelings of love that are caused. Only for the sake of moving the spirit to love should the soul at times recall the images and apprehensions, apprehensions that produce love. Actually here, he is speaking more broadly, like all images, you know, words of the Lord uh, that you've received from the Lord or something, or words of the scriptures, of course, insofar as they fire love, yeah, but don't get caught in the, you know, um, desire and the consolation possessively. The effect produced by the remembrance of this communication is not as strong as the effect at the time the communication was received. Yet when the communication is recalled, there is a renewal of love and an elevation of the mind to God. This is especially true when the soul remembers some figures, images, or supernatural feelings. They're usually so imprinted on the soul that they last a long time. Some are never erased from the soul. These apprehensions produced almost as often as remembered. Divine effects of love, sweetness, light, and so on. Sometimes in a greater degree, sometimes in a lesser. Because God impressed them for this reason. This is consequently a great grace for those on whom God bestows it possess within themselves a mind of blessings. The figures producing such effects are vividly impressed on the soul for they are not like other images and forms preserved in the fantasy, the imagination. The soul has no need of recourse to this faculty of the imagination when it desires to remember them. For it is aware that it has them within itself as an image in a mirror. When a soul possesses these figures formally within itself, it can safely recall them to obtain the effect of love. They will not be a hindrance to the union of love and faith, providing the soul does not desire to be absorbed with the figure. It must profit from the love by immediately leaving aside the figure. In this way, the remembrance will instead be a help to the soul. So it's interesting, you know, John the Cross, his spiritual canticle, the poem, it's something that he would repeat. He would sing uh, the words of the poem he wrote. We might think that as a little kind of um, egotistical, you know, someone to recite his own poem. <laughs> uh, but no, it's, it's about the Lord, and it's about his encounter with the Lord, and he repeated these lines. He sung them over and over again as he would travel. And uh, the similar effect was produced in his soul. It stirred up the love uh, in his soul for the Lord. So within the middle of the Ascent of Mount Carmel, there is this place for the valuable use of memories from the past of our encounters with the Lord. But they have to be used properly you know, to, to push you into the mystery of God. And in fact, we see the Old Testament doing this all the time. It's very scriptural to do what he's suggesting. You know, right? The patriarchs had an encounter with the living God. And what do they do? They set up a memorial stone. They build an altar. And then other people come to that altar, that memorial stone, and recall, you know, that holy memory. Uh, they recall, what's the word in the Eucharistic prayer? Um, you know what I'm talking about? What is it? Um, I think it's a Greek word. Um, it's, um, you know, there's a holy remembrance of this. A memorial of Christ's passion. Um, it's, uh, ah, oh, what's the word? It's okay, okay. Yeah, so, but we, we see this, this in the Old Covenant. They have an encounter with the Lord and they set up an altar, a memorial stone to remember that encounter with the Lord. And then other, they themselves go back there, other people come there to have not precisely the exact same experience of the Lord, but a, a like encounter with the Lord. And so we too should have like these memorial stones in our own lives, times of encounter with the Lord that were decisive and that did bring lasting change. These words from scripture that have, have struck your heart at different times to, to re-enter into that encounter and to re-enter into it in a new way. And as John says, you know, as often as these things are recalled, the soul remembers, as often as the soul remembers them, um, something of this effect is renewed. The effect of light, love, delight, spiritual renewal that it produced in them is, is, is renewed. 
I'm as a one memorial stone in my life, I remember that I sometimes return to, is um, when I was reconciled to the Catholic Church. So, um, you know, so anyways, you know, there were, there were months leading up to this study. You know, I was kind of an evangelical Protestant at the time. And there were months leading up to this. Um, but then I met a priest, a Marianist priest uh, at the University of Dayton, and he said, well, you know, whenever you're ready to, to come back, I can hear your confession. And so it was shortly before Lent, uh, 2001, like a few days before Lent. I, um, so I wrapped him. I said, okay, I'm ready. You can hear my confession. And so, um, yeah, so he brought me up to kind of their, their rec room or, you know, an office space and then uh, made my confession. And then I was kind of expecting that I would have to wait for communion the next day, but he brought me down to the chapel um, and uh, went to the tabernacle and gave me Holy Communion uh, right there, uh, right away. And then, uh, then he leaves. And he leaves me alone in that, that dark chapel uh, with the, the light on the crucifix. Um, and so, yeah, that's a place I return to sometimes. And it does renew kind of some of those same graces, you know, gratitude for the grace of being a Catholic, a practicing Catholic. It renews devotion in my heart to the Lord in the, in the Eucharist. I'm not like trying to recapture something from the past. It's a fresh encounter with the Lord, but something about that memorial stone with which the Lord did work so powerfully in and through, something of that is recalled. Some of the effects are renewed, uh, strengthened, and, and brought forward. But it's about encountering the Lord and all his majesty as he's present now, and not some memory from the past. But these key memories of encounter with the Lord um, can be an impetus, can be uh, the occasion of new, fresh graces in this way, like in the same model, the same form. Yeah? Do you have an example of something that where it would be the opposite almost, like, some sort of experience of prayer or an encounter with the Lord, but it wouldn't be helpful. Yeah. For the reasons opposite to what you're sure. sharing with them. Sure. I think the word I'm th- is, is it anamesis? Is that what we say about the Eucharist? <clears throat> anamesis? The Greek word. But yeah, anyway, holy remembering. And you know, Israel <laughs> Israel does that all, all, all the time. Lord, this is what you've done in the you know, recall the great deeds the Lord did uh, when he brought us through the Red Sea. They have that holy memory. They recall it to the Lord, you know, to open themselves to how the Lord wants to work now in the same way, to free us now from our sin, to free us now from this new slavery that we're in as a nation, as a church or something, uh, to renew what the Lord has done um, so that he might do things according to the same pattern now. It's not going to be exactly the same, but it's going to uh, meet us where we are now. So, yeah, the kind of remembering that would be unhelpful, not to, to get to your question, um, would, it would be more, it would be the thing like, um, you know, yesterday it was, it was such a powerful encounter with the Lord uh, in, in the chapel, and like, I'm trying to get there again, stir up the same feelings, trying to kind of generate these feelings alone, by on our own or something, and then like getting, when, when it's not there, to think something has gone wrong. Um, you know, how come, you know, so the Lord's not as present now. You could kind of uh, think as a result of that. Um, so that kind of thing wouldn't be uh, helpful. Or... There are some things, okay, you know, like the Lord says to you, my beloved. And so you can think about that in a way of, yeah, you know, he spoke to that me in a special way. And uh, I'm so special. <laughs> you know, we are all special, but it can turn into kind of a, a pride thing, um, a vanity thing. I'm more special than my sisters because the Lord said this to me. I mean, you know, we wouldn't, those thoughts wouldn't go through our mind exactly like that. But the impulses of the soul can go in that direction. Um, And so, yeah, things that lead to kind of a superiority over others. Uh, Yeah, being gifted in prayer at this time, 
you know, I must say something about how holy I am or something. I mean, again, you don't think those thoughts, but it's kind of these things can follow. Um, and so, yeah, those things wouldn't, wouldn't be helpful. Uh, it wouldn't be helpful to get stuck on the image itself t- uh, too much. Um, like, you know, even some, let's say the Divine Mercy image. Um, you know, it is a sacramental, lowercase s, channel of grace, means of grace, of contact with the Lord. But to um, have that push you to the living image of Christ in the tabernacle. Um, and not to, you know, some people can't pray, like John the Cross will say, unless they have their, their special image or something. And they're a little too tied to kind of this or that thing. Um, See, so, I mean, he has a whole chapter where he says, you know, what I've said about images is not to say there, there's no... Um, yeah, so he says, we're not asserting, as others claim, that there be no images or veneration of them. We are explaining the difference between these images and God and how souls should use the painted image in such a way as not to suffer hindrance in their movement toward the living image and how they should pay no more attention to images than is required for advancing to what is spiritual. The means are good, the images, the means are good and necessary for the attainment of the end, as are images for reminding us of God and the saints. But when people use and dwell on the means as though these were more than the means, uh, their excessive use of them becomes as much an impediment as anything else. Then he continues, the memory of these images, however, will not fail to benefit a person when they use them in the right way, because this remembrance is accompanied with love for whoever is represented is accompanied with love for whoever is represented. Images will always help individuals towards union with God, provided that no more attention is paid to them than necessary for this love and that souls allow themselves to soar when God bestows the favor from the painted image to the living God in forgetfulness of all creatures and things pertaining to creatures. So there is a way in which the living image, you know, it's, it's not the true and living God. Um, images are limited. God is, is so expansive. So there can be a way we can get so caught up on in images and like the emotions uh, that they uh, stir up that that can uh, leave us with a limited contact with the Lord instead of the more expansive uh, contact of spirit to spirit. But the images help to get us there as they kind of propel us, push us there, energize us in that ascent. Uh, but yeah, to be left with just faith, hope, and charity and um, that kind of contact, pure faith, hope, and charity and that kind of contact with the Lord, the incomprehensible, transcendent God who's close, who's present as one who's hidden because he's so, so expansive. So it sounds like the example that you it sounds like that same experience could be used in one direction or another like you could take the route to say Lord how great you are that you would look on me with love and da 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 and turn it into praise and then that would be useful but then seeing it as a source of oh man I'm so great that's where it would be Yeah. so that's what you're saying is it's more what you do with it versus the actual experience exactly right? yeah yep okay. yeah i mean the other part of that is too kind of um those things are much more limited uh than sort of an expansive approach to the lord mm-hmm. you know okay, another, so here's another good example um praise and worship music um mm-hmm. and it could take a, a real skill to do this um so if the praise and worship music is too is too tied up kind of with the emotions, and then your contact with the Lord is limited in that same way. Mm-hmm. And one way that this shows itself, and John the Cross speaks it when he speaks about, speaks about it when he speaks about spiritual lust. So he, he takes the seven deadly sins, mm-hmm. and he, uh, this is the beginning of Dark Night of the Soul, he takes the seven deadly sins and interprets them on a spiritual level. You know, so gluttony, he speaks about not so much gluttony with food, but gluttony for like spiritual consolations. 
And then when he comes to lust, he, he speaks about how, like, in our intimacy with the Lord, it can become sensual if it's too much wrapped up in the emotion and not purely enough of the spirit. And so then that's kind of a, a good sign. So it's not only that, that it, it becomes sensual, but even it, it's, it also is just limited. Mm-hmm. And by it becoming sensual, it kind of shows, okay, it's not of the spirit enough. And hence, it, it's, it's too limited. <laughs> And so praise and worship music is kind of, <clears throat> you know, there's energy there <clears throat> in the praise to elevate your soul and it's like making sure that energy is transferred <laughs> to elevate in the soul and this ascent to God. And it doesn't become sensual. Um, and so there is, I don't know, like channeling the energy. It might kind of, it's kind of strange to, to speak like that, but. Um, into the things of the spirit, and then that that energy, um, that that love, that stirred, uh, is directed to the in, incomprehensible God by pure faith, hope, and charity. So, So yeah, we should all have our memorial stones, just like the patriarchs in the Old Covenant in Israel had. These places of encounter with the Lord that we can return to for the sake of a new encounter, um, kind of an unbounded encounter, not, not bound by exactly what happened in the past. But another way that I think this comes through is through spiritual reading. So if you read Teresa of Avila, she's like sharing with us her memorial stones. Just like, you know, Jacob shared with the whole community his memorial stone, that place of encounter. Now the whole community gets to gather around and have a similar encounter with the Lord. You know, the, the shrines of the, the Old Covenant, uh, the, the temple. And so uh, the writings of the saints, Teresa of Avila and Tier Castles, John of the Cross, they're like sharing with us their memorial stones, these places of encounter with the Lord. And that's, we experience that a lot, right? It's through reading St. Therese that people come to have like a more uh, lofty encounter with the Lord. Ten, you know, your, um, your devotion to the Lord is stirred up. And this desire for holiness is stirred up. So she's opening up her soul, opening up her life, sharing with us her memorial stones. And the Lord often produces like graces in us. Not exactly the same graces Teresa of Avila received or John of the Cross received, but like graces the same kind of pattern. And so reading the lives of the reading the writings of the saints <clears throat> as they open our souls as they open their souls to us opens our souls to a, a like encounter with the Lord. More or less intense, like John the Cross says. But a help along the spiritual the way. But not to get stuck in that so you can only pray if you have trees of Avila in your hand. Uh, not to get stuck in it. Not to get stuck in like the emotional consolation that can be generated in that, but allowing that to be a place of encounter with the Lord and raising you to the Lord. And we'll always be left with this wound of love, this yearning for more. If it is true that, because we never possess God in this life and even these encounters, they're just (laughs) momentary and they're partial it's not the beatific vision. It's momentary and partial. And so these touches of love, they create the wound of love, create deeper wounds in us, yearning for, for the Lord. Father Haggerty, in his book, really brings out well uh, the kind of intensity of these yearnings. So Father Haggerty, um, like rather than, you know, one way to treat the, the wounds of love is to take John's categories in Spiritual Canticle 7, those three levels, and as you're bringing his doctrine together, kind of include that in some way as kind of your organizing principle. Um, Haggerty doesn't do that so much as he really focuses this on in on... Um, kind of the, the emptiness of the faculties that we're left with, yearning for the Lord, because they're not filled. 
We don't, we don't get filled in this life. And so you're left with this thirsting for the Lord. And he does just a marvelous job of um, showing what that uh, yearning, thirsting for the Lord looks like and how it translates itself into good works and to trying to please the Lord in, in other ways. And you hear, he never brings up Mother Teresa uh, in this chapter, but you hear um, that she's in the background uh, of this. <clears throat> and when you hear that throughout this whole book, John the Cross is very much um, interpreting yeah, Don of the Cross, <laughs> Father Donald Haggerty. Uh, <laughs> that's your fun fact for the day. Um, I heard when he was in seminary, his seminarian brothers uh, nicknamed him Don of the Cross. So. <laughs> So, so Don of the Cross, his reading of John of the Cross is very much shaped by Mother Teresa's um, darkness and thirst for the Lord. You know, that lasted you know, even to the end, even while she was in you know spiritual marriage, she surely was. So it's a valuable thing to emphasize, and it does resonate with where many of us are, uh, just the kind of the empty thirsting for the Lord with seeming little kind of consolation here or there. <clears throat> but on the other hand, it is just one aspect of John of the Cross's thought and the, the whole of his doctrine. Um, you know, just another, like John of the Cross, his spiritual doctrine. You could take as, as you try to bring together all the texts, you could take as an organizing principle um, what he says in like Spiritual Canticle 37.4, uh, there are three things that have to come together to reach perfection, much spiritual effort, much spiritual suffering, and many sensible and intellectual favors from the Lord. So those are kind of the three elements that have to come together in attaining to perfection. And so that could be kind of an organizing principle for bringing together all the aspects of John's life. Um, Haggerty very much focuses on uh, the spiritual effort and the spiritual suffering. Um, and I think he could, if you want to do a full doctrine of John the Cross, you should bring in more also um, some treatment of the visits, the sensible and intellectual favors to kind of round, round out the picture. Now what Haggerty does treat in those two, those, those two aspects of the three, he does in a marvelous way. And he does just in a way that's a masterpiece and that's very helpful. And it, it will be very helpful for souls, uh, people who read this. Um, and so there's certainly benefit to what he's doing here. Um, but yeah, okay, so that's uh, just uh, something to keep in mind if you read this in the, in the future. But no, it's, it's good. And so uh, chapter 14, Wounds of Love, Branding Marks of Contemplation. And he's really treating like the yearning lover here, uh, the thirsty lover, which you know, it's a strong theme in John of the Cross. Um, so he says the hidden presence of God is a truth of inescapable provocation never fully lifted or overcome in a lifetime showing many variations in the experience of a soul sometimes the hidden presence of God is stronger in the silence of prayer other times it is met outside prayer in the sudden opportunity for sacrifice or in the disfigured face of Jesus hiding in a poor person God as elusive hiding behind shadows, speaking in quiet whispers, disappearing from sight even in the encounter with him, is all a realization of greater faith. His presence has no predictable quality and offers no promise of an easy recognition. Shadows and darkness can become for lengthy periods the ordinary ambiance of prayer. When the darkness stretches over time and is greater, the thought of God's withdrawal can trouble souls in their silent prayer, despite how close they may be to God. The contemplative paradox of darkness as the setting for a very personal contact with God. Um, so then he talks about that this, this love for the Lord. It's a love for the Lord above all other things. And it's this yearning for the Lord that's never satisfied in this life. And so he makes a good point that this yearning for the Lord, this expression of love that's not satisfied, 
um, sort of in that dissatisfaction in this life, in this frustration, the soul looks for any way it can uh, to express its love for, for the Lord. So this comes out in good works. So he speaks about kind of the, this frustration, this striving that's not fulfilled, then uh, coming out in the practice of good works and pleasing the beloved in that way, uh, showing your love for the beloved in your service of the poor, in your service of uh, your sisters. Uh, so through these wounds of love, God takes the soul captive. It, it stills. God takes the soul's heart, which John the Cross expresses beautifully in those early stanzas of spiritual canto, like stanza number nine. Why, since you have wounded this heart, don't you heal it? And why, since you stole it from me, do you leave it so and fail to carry off what you have stolen? You know, he notes that in human love, when we grow in love, our delight in the presence of the beloved increases. Uh, but with God, since the presence of the beloved is never so tangible and clear, it's sort of a different response. It's our dissatisfaction with everything else that often comes up as our love for the Lord uh, increases. And then it's choosing the, the Lord who, who is hidden over these other things that becomes the expression of love. So it's not so much experience in the delight of being in the, the presence of the beloved as much as um, choosing the hidden beloved over these other more tangible and appealing goods, uh, luring goods, um, or, you know, as they appear good. Uh, he speaks of a, a kind of holy discontentment. Uh, not, nothing can fill us in this life, and we keep seeking, reaching out uh, for, for the, the hidden God uh, whom we can't fully experience. And so we're left kind of suspended between heaven and earth. We don't yet enjoy the joys of heaven, uh, and yet, but we're separated through our acts of will, through kind of these, these joys of earth and search of the beloved. So you're just kind of uh, hung there, suspended between heaven and earth. Angela Foligno uses that image in a very striking way. A begin from the 1100s. Um, I, I, she might be the first to develop it, uh, but then it gets taken up in other people, like John Cross, Teresa of Avila. Um, so this this desire, this longing for the Lord that's not um, fulfilled leads to just reaching out for him. And then kind of, he speaks even like through that frustration, the saint is like driven out uh, in this search for, for its beloved and driven out in a generous a service of others. Um, Okay, yeah, so that, let me just read some, some of this. If we think for a moment about what God does with the soul he favors, it is evident that he seeks to draw it into an exclusive love for himself. Nothing outside of God can be allowed to consume the soul's deepest desire and affections. The inability to find lasting satisfaction in anything, including prayer itself for long stretches, becomes a continual goad to a soul. Uh, it goads it on. A hunger for God then consumes the soul, and nothing else that might be sought does anything other than bring it back to a desire for God. Nothing in life satisfies so much. In, nothing in life satisfies so much. Instead, everything calls us remembrance of God. It is as though all things worth remembering have become a memory of a time spent with God. The dissatisfaction of love is a blessed state that animates a deeper advancement in contemplative life. The wound of dissatisfied love carves itself into an all contemplative striving, carves itself into all contemplative striving. At the same time that such love is painful, it is increasingly sought. It is possible in this sense that everything in a life may serve in God's mysterious plan to inflame greater desire for God. God becomes more solicitous for such souls, even as he maintains his concealment. And so he leads them to generous self-giving and a more sacrificial life by providing these opportunities. Let us say it again. The saints were saints because they were contemplatives in their deeper life of prayer and souls of great sacrificial self-giving outside prayer. When God consumes the longing of the soul, the soul wants nothing but to seek for him and to prove its love for him. 
When God consumes the longing of the soul, the soul wants nothing but to seek for him and to prove its love for him. The holy dissatisfaction of love with its unsatiated desires plunges a soul increasingly into losing itself for love and for others. Behind these desires to give of itself is always a longing of the soul that God show himself more fully, but that's unfulfilled. So in effect, this becomes a perpetual wound of love. The perpetual wound of love is the unrelieved dissatisfaction within a soul that is in love with God. Uh, So that's page 310 or so, uh, 318. Uh, He picks it up again, and it's, yes, this is better. I just want to get at this. The soul's truth is in its love for the beloved, but he has disappeared and forsaken it, stripping it. The pain leaves it with no recourse but to go out seeking for the beloved. The dissatisfaction and pain that takes it out in search of the beloved is nonetheless a salutary stake. The soul truly in love with God goes out from itself in hunger, forgetting itself, and searches for ways to please God. It longs for him, and nothing else satisfies it but to find ways to show love for him, even though he seems absent. In one sense, it is an empty vessel of painful craving. In another sense, it is a soul of expectation. It becomes, in the best sense of the term, a driven soul in its seeking, intensely desirous of God, steady in its determination to remain on this path of a great love for the beloved. So St. John says, Spiritual Canticle 9, lovers are said to have their hearts stolen or seized by the object of their love. For the heart will go out from self and become fixed on the object, on the loved object. Thus their heart or love is not for themselves, but for what they love. Accordingly, the soul can know clearly whether or not she loves God purely. If she loves him, her heart or love will not be set on herself or her own satisfaction and gain, but on pleasing God and giving him honor and glory. In the measure she loves herself, that much less she loves God. Spiritual Canticle 9.5. So it's a restless craving for the beloved. A kind of spiritual um, sickness seems to overtake it. Yearning for love, dying out of love. But of course this is not an unhealthy condition. For the frustration plunges a soul into a greater desire for self-giving and generosity. So yeah, I think that it's really um, striking and really key what Haggerty's bringing out here. And you know, we, can, we can hear Mother Teresa in that, you know, just that intense longing for the soul, and that drives her to just such generous, self-giving love. Although the beloved's absence, just that, that draw, that push, that drivenness for God, it shows itself in all the ways we, we try to please God, all the ways that we show our love for God and our service of neighbor and our, our self-gift uh, to the other. And we see this in St. John of the Cross, Spiritual Canticle 35. So this is, this is my concluding comments. And this was originally the end of Spiritual Canticle. Later, John adds five stanzas. But it's about this exclusivity of the soul's love for God. She lived in solitude and now in solitude has built her nest. And in solitude, the Lord guides her. He alone who also bears in solitude the wound of love. And so the Lord himself bears this wound of love for us. This is a great mystery. You know, God who is all sufficient, he doesn't need us. He doesn't need our love. Uh, yet he's, he's delighted by our love and our acts of love. So we can get into a kind of a, ah, I think I just need to, I need to start this, the next hash. <laughs> uh, so let's 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 take our, our break um, here. Are any questions or comments? Why don't we take our break? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, what spiritual critical was the in the measure she loves herself, she loves um, God. Well, that's nine nine five. I'm sorry. Nine five. Spiritual critical nine five. 
but yeah, no, it's um, yeah, and what what Haggerty's bringing out here, I think, is you know, it's part of all of our experience, um, and um, so it, it, it's so helpful, and to see that connection between contemplation and virtue, mm-hmm. contemplation and our good works, mm-hmm. you know, it is part of our love. Um, Affective love and effective love is the distinction Francis de Sales makes. Affective love in the times of prayer, effective love and showing our love for God in our service of others. I just had that insight, almost the, the frustration of not being able to possess the God we love so much, that frustration goading us in our self-sacrificial love for others, uh, I think is very insightful and then helpful. Mm-hmm. And it, it, rings, it rings true. Um, for people um, and so yeah there's that drive to the Lord that that's unsatisfied and so it drives you to show uh, the love for the Lord in your service of a neighbor and uh, pushes you hard in that direction okay so that's contemplation that's like you know contemplation fill, spilling over into to virtue and service of others we can think of it in terms of an overflow but we can also think of this in terms of this uh, unsatisfied hunger that keeps pushing you towards sacrificial love and giving yourself to God uh, through through your neighbor. A song lyric just came to mind. Yeah. Yeah. If you can't be with the one you love, <laughs> love the one you're with. <laughs> you're right. quite in this perspective. <laughs> you're right. Yeah. Exactly. It works. Exactly. That's good. That's good. Yeah. And some, uh, just something to point out here, um, a move I like to make, and I think it's true to John the Cross, is that there, there is deep consolation in the midst of, of desolation. You know, like John experienced in that prison cell those nine months, mm-hmm. he shared with those sisters, as I've shared before, it was a time of great desolation, but also a time of great consolation. And so there is, hidden in all this, um, even in the midst of kind of the desolation on a more superficial level, there, there is a deep contact with the Lord uh, that, that's there. And so there is something of the joy of the Lord in that. I mean, you can't be in contact with the Lord, who is joy itself, joy himself, uh, without having something of that there. But it's deeper than sort of what we're normally after. But it's there. It's there. So another way to think about this, two ways kind of from uh, the human perspective. If we are made for um, making that self-gift of ourselves to others, right? that's what John Paul II says, uh, quoting Gaudium et Spes, 23, I think. Um, Man does not find himself except in making of himself a complete gift of self to the other. Right? So there, there is a way, if that's what we're made for, and we're living like Haggerty is, is explaining, uh, in that like self-emptying of yourself for love of neighbor. You know, however like painful and that self-sacrificial that is, there is going to be like a joy there, and a deep satisfaction because you're becoming what you're created to become. Mm-hmm. That one who lives as a self-gift for others. So in dying, we 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 find true life. You'll come alive when you when you learn to die. And so there's a great, great resonance in what we're created to be as human beings, as Christians, redeemed in Christ, in that self-emptying love. So in the midst of that emptiness and affliction of the sacrificial gift of self to others, you are coming to fulfillment as yourself. So there's going to be deep joy there because you're being who you are meant to be. And then the other, so that's more of the anthropological approach, what we are, who we are. The other is more of the theocentric, the theological, strictly speaking, approach. <clears throat> As we empty ourselves, it's to make space for God, for him to fill us more. Ephesians uh, 3, 18 through 19, that you might know the breadth, length, height, and depth, to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. So in our self-emptying, there's a filling being filled by all the fullness of God. But then there's something very interesting here. Who, who is this God we're being filled with? What is he? Well, he's Trinitarian, self-emptying love. It's the love of the Trinity that empties itself as it enters into our human fallen situation. 
that's filling us. So there's something very uh, mysterious here about in our very self-emptying, we're being filled with God, who is a mystery of self-emptying love. <clears throat> and so in the midst of all the anguish <clears throat> and aridity and dryness and longing of this self-giving, self-emptying, you are meeting God there in a more profound way. You are being filled with God there. Uh, the God who is self-giving love, self-emptying love, and the God for whom that self-giving love is ultimate bliss. So we'll take our break now. <laughs>